to to start the outline of my talk, uh, I will put all, I'll just emphasize different steps of information extraction, uh, from name entity recognition to relation extraction, and this um, it will include the supervised sentence-based and uh, document level relation extraction, but also ways to enrich the word representation by injecting syntactic information. Um, then I will focus on uh, areas which are more relevant for biology and for the reconstruction of uh, pathways, such as um, <clears throat> event extraction. And in event extraction, uh, nestness and nested events are very important, especially for uh, the area of biomedicine. And I will conclude with um, uh, the identification of uncertain events and uh, with a and one application, which is basically how we can develop a, a systems that incorporate uh, uncertainty for ranking the events. So <clears throat> I will start with the, the simplest, um, uh, the first step of information extraction, which are name entities. And uh, this will include nested entities. So the, the notion of a nestedness will be part of my talk and an application. So, um, <clears throat> Why this is important, what are the usefulness of nested entities? Uh, it's a very first component of different, uh, uh, several downstream tasks, relation extraction, event extraction, and search. And uh, it's also you can use a, a name entities for risk analysis and different types of classification based on, con on contained entities. Now, one of the challenges, of course, of uh, nested entities, especially in biomedicine, is that they contain lots of nested. Uh, as you can see in uh, the right-hand side, interleukin-2 receptor alpha has protein uh, interleukin-2 nested, or very often we have, like in the second sentence, narcotic-induced respiratory distress, we have overlapping, we have ambiguous, so we could be an adverse drug event and then reason. So <clears throat> in, um, for all these type of, uh, the, for all these reasons, we need to have, um, additional context to disambiguate nested uh, uh, name entities. And uh, very often I have to say that still is quite difficult if we want to go with very fine grained entity categories. So um, 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 the, obviously, as I said before, the whole concept of nested is that uh, they're typically embedded in longer entities uh, as, as we see here. So um, uh, it's basically uh, something which is extremely common. Uh, I'll mention um, uh, one approach, there are several approaches of uh, dealing with nestness. Uh, and I will mention the work of, uh, we have done with Meiji Ju and Makoto Miwa on a neural layer model for nested um, name entity recognition. So if we look at uh, related work for nested uh, name entities, uh, most of the time, uh, earlier work uh, depended on uh, hand basically crafted features or domain knowledge. Um, so um, there is, of course, work on uh, neural networks, but they didn't really consider the dependencies between uh, the nested entities. And where we're talking about dependencies, we refer to uh, appearances of outer entities or near and inner entities. So um, um, we use um, pre-trained uh, word the bendings and use the inner entities as input to outer entities. So <clears throat> the important part also here for us was to not to use any um, um, external resources or any other syntactic information. So the model that has been developed is uh, quite, uh, it's, dom it's basically agnostic domain independent. So the model is uh, basically designed uh, based on a, um, a sequential stack of uh, flat um, NER layers that detect the nested entities uh, in an end-to-end -end manner. So um, um, the, the flat, each flat uh, NER layer consists of um, a, a CRF, a single uh, LSTM layer and a CRF layer. So if we have the following sentence of model interleukin, that we have two entities, a protein and DNA, and we first um, stack one flat NER layer to identify the um, inner entity interleukin two, 
which is then further used as input to identify the outer entity interleukin to receptor alpha gene expression. And the model stops stacking the flat NER layers until we, don't, uh, we cannot detect any more entities. So um, um, the basic uh, idea of the model is that uh, it reuses uh, the same NER layers, extracts uh, entities in an inside-out sound manner, and uses dependencies among the nested entities, and is also independent of different resources. So for the <clears throat> experimental evaluation, uh, we can see the performance of our model and other related work. And uh, we applied this on two types of corpora. One is a general uh, language like a ACE 2005, and GINIA, which is uh, for a, a corpus specifically developed for biomedicine. And we can see the performance uh, on both uh, um, you know, data sets. We have applied, uh, uh, applied this model in several other tasks uh, for, for instance, extracting uh, PICO elements for systematic reviews or COPD, et cetera, which I, I'm not going to mention. Basically, uh, it's a, a very uh, important step for us to identify neural, uh, basically nested entities for the subsequent steps. So, <clears throat> uh, now I think I like I would like to mention um, something that we can do we we can develop basically mention mentioning only the name entities and a, a, an important application for us was to do semantic search based on the whole of PubMed um, the PubMed abstracts so the system so all, all the things that I'm mentioning here on the website of NACTEM and uh, the system Thalia is still, it's, uh, it's uh, available for people to use. Uh, so the whole idea is to do semantic search based on name entities. Uh, and in this case, because we're working on biomedicine, we, we identify eight uh, types of concepts, but obviously we can uh, add more entities uh, um, as, uh, as it's needed. Um, so, um, the whole idea is here, if I have um, uh, the search query box, which is GAT, and in biomedicine we have lots of uh, acronyms, um, we have an advanced search, which is basically a faceted search of the different name entities. And uh, on the left-hand side, we have the different article metadata, journal, et cetera, mesh terms and type. So, um, uh, we now look a bit how the system, the infrastructure works on the identifying the entities. If we put GAD, we'll have 8,000 abstracts. Uh, and then we start uh, drilling down, narrowing down uh, our query based on the name entities. Uh, so we have the different entity facets like genes or, or uh, um, you know, or uh, drugs. Um, so if we see here the, um, uh, our query, uh, we have um, for GAD, we can find, um, we can link with the PubMed abstract. We see the full text, the, um, the, so the full text view, the abstract, which is highlighted with the different name entities we have identified. And also these are normalized, they are linked with the different databases. So we see the information about an entity and uh, the databases, which is linked. Now, um, I'd like to see how that works with the, to, to show how this works with disambiguating. An acronym like uh, GAD uh, can be both a gene and can be a disease. So if I want to narrow, now, narrow it down as um, uh, a gene, I have 1000 abstracts, so I now narrow down my search. Or uh, if I want to have, for instance, disease, uh, I could have a different set of documents. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, the, behind the, the, in the, in the back end, there are other um, components that we have used, such for instance, um, acronym recognition and acronym disambiguation that um, identifies the acronyms and expands them automatically. So basically it's the creation of the dictionary to be able to do that. Um, so we can, of course, have a Boolean search like um, genes uh, uh, as, a, as a gene and also 
uh, use, um, uh, you know, finding diseases and genes at the same time, like schizophrenia, etc. So, um, as, as we see, the more we, um, <clears throat> we narrow down and the more we're combining different searches based on name entities, we have uh, uh, more, we, we basically, we, we don't need to set so many abstracts in PubMed. Um, the system is, uh, we update it uh, basically once a year. Now we're about to update it. So if you use it, um, uh, we're going to do it in the next couple of weeks. So um, <clears throat> the next step of uh, my talk is about um, relations, uh, which is the next step of uh, information extraction. And the relations uh, have, uh, they're first of all based on um, sentences. Uh, and both in those cases, uh, it's mostly supervised techniques. <clears throat> I decided to omit unsupervised methods we have developed, but also um, document level and syntactically inform where the presentations. So <clears throat> again, relation extraction is an important part of other tasks like event extraction, which I will mention later, but also question answering and also search based on relations and any type of uh, extraction of structured information from raw text. Uh, because my topic is uh, biomedicine, I will mention um, two applications, <clears throat> drug, drug and gene disease uh, associations from uh, electronic health records. Um, so these uh, applications and other applications what we have done, which I'm not going to describe is how we constructed uh, a knowledge graph with based on relations and entities and um, uh, how we actually develop networks with reactions to drugs. So <clears throat> to start about this is uh, the, um, uh, you know, we're talking about electronic health records. We want to extract relation extraction uh, and since uh, the automatic extractions, um, uh, basically automatic extraction of associations between biomedical entities from uh, uh, health records is quite challenging. And <clears throat> the reason uh, that um, the, the extraction is challenging is first of all, that the context is not always present. Uh, as we can see in this uh, example, uh, for instance, the humans uh, uh, infer relations between Bactrim and Rush, uh, but however, it's something quite you know, difficult to model. At the same time, uh, the, there are positive things that patterns express um, uh, specific relations between entities without having any, for instance, uh, a supportive context. So we have patterns like drug strength form, which we can uh, take advantage of. So the work I'm mentioning is something that we participated in. Um, <clears throat> the, the good thing also in uh, this domain is there are lots of shared tasks and lots of uh, label data that we can uh, leverage. Uh, so we participated in uh, the N2C2 shared task in 2018, which are basically um, and contained annotations, discharge summaries from uh, uh, MIMIC uh, uh, 3. So, <clears throat> Uh, we see here the types of entities and the relations that uh, they are part of this uh, corpus. Um, so um, the, the data basically use this chart summaries and we have at least one uh, diverse drug event per summary. But <clears throat> as we can see from the data statistics, uh, duration and um, uh, adverse drug event were the least uh, frequent entities. And uh, as a consequence, uh, the relations between uh, duration and drug and eddy and drug were the least frequent uh, relation categories. So <clears throat> how, <clears throat> apologies. So um, again, uh, the main challenge at the time is that um, in relation extraction, um, uh, the main challenges are they assume that there is a single pair uh, per sentence. And typically, the people did not, did, not, did not include, did not take into account the different dependencies uh, among different pairs. So um, all the things that uh, we observe at the time uh, was lots of dependency of external syntactic tools that um, they were um, resulting in domain specific models. 
So the motivation and the hypothesis here is that uh, <clears throat> the relation between an entity pair can be supported by coexisting pairs in the same sentence. And so basically we aim to use the uh, additional pairs in the sentence to model a pair of interest in our work. And, um, and this is the work by um, Fene Christopoulou, who uh, was my PhD student. Um, so the example here, we find um, uh, the relation between uh, hypotension and uh, atropine. But uh, however, this relation is not so evident when we first uh, read the, the, the paper. However, when we use the um, intermediate associations between hypotension and um, um, uh, dopamine, um, so for instance, we have uh, uh, AD and drug and uh, with evidence uh, wind down and also dopamine and atropine. We can infer then that um, the relation between uh, uh, hypotens uh, hypotension and uh, atropine. Uh, this is actually quite useful um, if we don't have enough uh, contextual words present in the sentence. Uh, so in this setting, we can use um, additional drug-drug inter uh, drug -drug interactions, although they're not annotated in the sentence to boost actually our AD and drug. So uh, how um, basically this is, has been done was to um, map the sentence in a graph structure where the nodes are the entities and the edges are the representations of relations in the sentence. Um, so the model um, is actually is called the walk-based model. And after uh, the edges are constructed, the model um, aims to, um, uh, to uh, you know, the, uh, the, we aim to model chains basically of uh, interactions between the different target entities. So um, the walk-based layer is a two-step process. Uh, first of all is the walk generation. And during the walk uh, generation, uh, we combine two direct representations into a direct one. Uh, so as you can see here, we have a hypertension atropine and dopamine and atropine. Um, the next step is uh, the walk um, um, aggregation where we combine the old, the, the red or the direct representations into the new, the yellow indirect representations and again, to produce a new single representation, the hypertension and atropine. And the edges are updated uh, using all these direct and direct associations. And at some point, uh, um, as we can see here, we repeat it when the, we don't have any longer any walks. So that's the model. <clears throat> and um, I, I'll just uh, skim a bit about the experimental evaluation, but an important part is we wanted to find out if by adding additional drug-drug interaction, interactions that uh, we, we found out and they were not part of the, of the data, the annotations, we can help the model performance. And um, we found out that basically this was mostly the case, <clears throat> although sometimes not, not very evident because we can see that the frequency, for instance, in, in drug and reason <clears throat> and drug have improved performance with um, additional uh, DDIs. Um, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, for reason uh, um, uh, and drug, uh, we see slightly deterioration. And also, this can be explained because uh, sometimes the, um, uh, the, the semantic types are confused, the reason and DDI. So, um, and also reason is also a more um, uh, frequent class. Um, so basically, and the whole idea is here to use the walk-based model to produce uh, a relation extraction. But um, this is based still on sentences. And the next step is now to extract um, <clears throat> uh, relations, which are um, at a document level. Um, so again, this is uh, very important because um, uh, you know, we have two types of relations based on entities and based on concepts. 
And in the first scenario, the entity based, we consider the occurrence of its entity as a, a, a different, basically named entity. So oxytocin and ox are different. But in the second, we consider them the multiple occurrences as mentions of a, a specific concept, which is um, basically oxytocin. So both of them belong to the same uh, concept. And to do that, um, <clears throat> we use um, multi-instance learning. And the goal is to determine the relation of a pair based on all pair instances. So these uh, multiple instances are called mentions and the cluster of the instances are called um, concepts and entities. Uh, so an intuitive example of uh, what we call now intra or inter-sentence associations is shown in this um, uh, you know, paragraph in this abstract. And we can see different observations. First of all, um, inter-sentence uh, associations require some kind of logical reasoning and inferencing. Uh, very often entities occur early, like in the sentence, like spotoma, for instance. And some sentences are not uh, so much informative for the association we want to find, like for instance, the second sentence. So um, uh, <clears throat> for that, the co continuing with the whole, the idea of, um, of graphs, uh, in this case, um, um, a follow-up work was published in, uh, at the MNLP in 2019, was to construct a graph, a sparse graph, um, which has multiple nodes. So it's a heterogeneous graph, it has entities, as I mentioned before, dimensions, but sentences and different types of edges. So um, basically the model in this case uh, deviates from existing graph models because it focuses on constructing uh, uh, unique nodes and edges, but the information it uh, incorporates in, into edge representations rather than node representations. Um, so um, the model now in case creates new paths between the nodes and we can update the existing path. So for instance, we can see we create a representation for the path uh, within the yellow node and the brown node. So um, the, the whole um, um, you know, model consists of uh, this uh, five layers, uh, the document sentences and the entities and the mentions because it's uh, supervised are assumed given. Um, the sentence, the sentence and code and layer <clears throat> where we construct but contextualize the sentence uh, level of word representations. And this, of course, can be uh, replaced by any encoder like BERT or BioBERT, et cetera. Uh, the graph construction la uh, layer is what I mentioned before, where we construct the document level graph with different types of nodes and edges. Then is the, the inference when we create the paths uh, between um, <clears throat> the concepts of interest and then the, the classifier. Um, so um, the important part is also here that the, the model is um, independent of uh, any syntactic uh, dependency tools and can achieve state-of-the-art performance uh, on manually annotated and document level, for instance, data sets. Um, so uh, I'll give you some of the um, experimental evaluation. Um, so um, we um, tested the model on two... Uh, biomedical data sets. <clears throat> the first is the chemical and disease, uh, which is um, um, a data set which is human annotated and contains 1,500 uh, um, abstracts. 30% are intersentence. And the other one is um, um, a corpus which has been created by distant supervision, the gene disease. And um, again, contains 30,000 abstracts. So compared with the model of, with state of the art, uh, which are again, um, <coughs> independent uh, of uh, external tools or so use additional tools and uh, data. And we um, evaluate it on three different settings. Uh, the first of all is the, <coughs> the edge oriented graph, the proposed, which is actually instantiates um, parts of the graph. The other is fully connected graph. Another is what without we discarding the inference mechanism, the walk model, and only trained only on sentences. So um, the results here are that the, the document basically 
um, level associations are very important for also intra-sentence detection in both data sets. So if we see the AOG version sent, um, and those are the comparisons of, of, with other uh, methods and other techniques. Uh, so um, for the GDA, <clears throat> uh, again, which is a distantly supervised data set, we found that the full uh, graph produces better performance uh, for the inter-sentence uh, pairs, uh, which is mostly attributed to the noisy um, nature of the corpus. Um, so um, the, again, uh, those are the results that we see the model, the AOG, which is partially instantiated, performs uh, in a competitive manner. Uh, <clears throat> so now I'm going to um, speak, talk briefly again on relations, but um, a, a bit how we can enrich existing uh, um, uh, deep learning models with um, a syntactically informed word representations. And this is the work of my PhD student, Fifi Tran, has been published in Neurocomputing. So most deep learning models, again, depend, as we all know, on word representations, which are really rely on large uh, pre-trained language models. But in language, we need to, we think that uh, taking into account syntactic information, it's quite important for, um, um, for many of our tasks and many of downstream tasks. So, the question here we had is um, uh, how can we um, incorporate syntactic information because other people incorporate the syntactic information into the model without actually changing the architecture of the, uh, of the, the, of the model. Um, so our the premises here, what our hypothesis that uh, the syntactic informed representations um, could actually incorporate syntactic information into the neural models without changing the, their architecture. So <clears throat> how this is happening? So basically, uh, we construct the, the CIWRs based on both uh, static, uh, <clears throat> like a word to vec and contextual representations. So, um, and then we use basically the pre-trained word representations uh, as base representations, and they, so we fit them into a, a graph-based encoder. But also we can use existing syntactic tools which are basically um, um, automatically, we're using automatically labeled data rather than gold uh, uh, corpora. So um, um, the, the, the main thing is that uh, the graph um, based encoder uh, is the core component which actually integrates syntactic information. And for this, we mean dependency parts and a part of speech tagging. Um, so this type of information is then injected into the embeddings of, uh, of uh, the GCN. And uh, then we, uh, we try to we evaluate it, the, um, how this syntactic information, the injected syntactic information can actually um, improve several tasks. Uh, so then we're using the CRIWRs to compare uh, different performance. So basically the, the goal is really um, to incorporate uh, dependency uh, context into the word representations. And um, we use basically dependency tree structure, the, the, the nodes and the words, and the edges are the dependency relations. Uh, and uh, we pre-trained the CIW model to jointly capture both uh, dependencies and tagging and uh, to, to uh, preserve our order because is important in language, we add the previous and the next word uh, connections to um, uh, the words. Um, <clears throat> so some uh, results of that work, um, basically um, um, it, for us to, 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 we compared with word to vec and with PubMed, um, ELMO, and then we compared the SWR, our method with ELMO and PubMed. Uh, so um, for the binary, so we used also for name entities, which I don't include here, for the binary uh, uh, relation extraction data set, we use ELMO. And then uh, for the ternary, which is basically the events, we use uh, PubMed as base representation. And um, by the way, um, we, we, we see here that the results actually show that by injecting syntactic information, improves uh, the performance of these tasks. 
So to summarize that uh, <clears throat> for, um, and perhaps I will talk about a bit about these uh, uh, conclusions tomorrow. Um, for large scales, large scale pre-trained language models, we want to um, explore basically the syntactic information uh, uh, in the large amount of data. And we want to um, basically pre-incorporate this syntactic information um, which means into the, into the pre-training models, which means fewer parameters need to be uh, optimized on downstream tasks. Um, also, um, existing methods which are try to incorporate uh, linguistic uh, constraints to PLMs, typically requiring training from scratch in a multi-task learning setting. And this is uh, computationally expensive and time consuming. So one other outcomes of this work is uh, uh, not type consuming and avoids actually pre-training models from scratch. Um, so um, basically by pre-computing our representations and injecting the syntactic knowledge, we enrich the uh, pre-trained language models. Uh, now I'm going to the last uh, part of my talk. Um, and this is um, um, about uh, event. Let's uh, see how I'm doing with time. Sorry. Okay. I have another 15 minutes, I think. Yes. So uh, the last part, which is uh, <clears throat> because I'm talking about biomedicine, is events. And I'll talk about event extraction and nested events and uh, uncertainty. So <clears throat> one of the, the reasons we worked on, it, on events is because we wanted to. Um, um, construct to support the uh, biological model construction. And this is uh, largely driven by um, fine state statements. Uh, and these fine state statements are really uh, extracted and distilled from the literature. So this is actually quite important for any kind of pathway reconstruction because to find, you have to find entities, you have to find relations and events. And typically the events, the, um, there are energy relations, they show about the show interactions between any types of uh, concepts. Um, so um, events basically, and I'll just um, come here, are um, basically capture this kind of uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, biological uh, pertinence. We can find uh, phosphorylation, negative regulation, and different interacting participants. Uh, which play specific roles in pathways. Uh, they can be modifiers, they can be reactants, and they can be the, they can cause, they can show the location of an interaction. So this is the fundamental way why we wanted to work on that. Um, and they can be used for different applications. So again, we can do search based on events, for question answering based on events. Uh, we can create um, knowledge graphs based on events and uh, many other things. So I, I will, the application I'll talk is about pathway reconstruction, how we can automatically reconstruct a pathway using events. And the applications are numerous to mention, but there are some here from pharmacogenetics to cancer research and systems biology and functional genomics. So um, what are the <clears throat> events in the first place? Uh, and I'll mention just one of the systems we have developed. Um, so first of all, here we have a sentence like um, the RBA and blah, 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 virus constructs transformer the fluid cells. Um, we see here, this is from um, the shared tasks we have de uh, um, developed a few years ago. So we see again a flat, the notion of flat and nested. So um, uh, a flat event is um, cell um, um, transformation and uh, it has a trigger um, uh, transformed. And uh, the flat event has also a theme, uh, which is an argument, which is the, the cell entities or erythroid cells. And the positive um, regulation, which is, is again has the same trigger, transform, is a nested event uh, with a cell um, um, uh, transformation as its theme, which is actually the one below. And uh, the organism, which we see on the left hand side, entity as its cause. So in this example, we see um, something which is very common in that field. We have uh, two triggers that they share the same textual span, which is transformed. And we call those triggers nested triggers, which allow us to do basically with multiple events uh, indicated by the same basically phrase. Um, and also we can see here, we talked about nested 
um, name entities before. Um, the, this example uh, involves nested and overlapping entities. Um, so the organism contains uh, a gene and gene product, uh, etc. So the, um, uh, the, the system we have developed to deal with that is called uh, Deep Event Mine. And um, it basically consists of, um, uh, of four layers. Um, the first uh, layer is BERT, uh, which actually assigns the contextual representations. And um, actually, um, we can you can use any any type of uh, uh, chain models, CyBERT, BioBERT, etc. Um, and then it's the entity and uh, the trigger, uh, and the, and the role in the event. So the entity and the trigger layer assigns um, the um, entity and trigger types to overlapping text uh, spans uh, in a sentence. Uh, as those, uh, you know, there are various ways of doing that, but in this case, uh, the extracted uh, nested uh, triggers and entities at once to use all subword information. Then we have the role uh, um, basically layer, all those relations, so the trigger pairs, trigger, um, and trigger entity and trigger pairs. And the event uh, layer um, enumerates uh, all the combinations of the um, uh, role pairs to construct um, event candidates. Um, so each candidate then is classified as event or non-event. And uh, in addition, we here in this, but I'll mention a bit later, we can detect uh, speculation, negation, and other types of modifications. So this is a, an end-to-end, the deep event mine um, um, is a, a way of extracting events. And uh, nested events are uh, built in a, a bottom-up manner. So again, it's the same idea as before uh, with a uh, name entity. So basically we classify events that have, that have no trigger arguments. We call them the flat events. And then we repeat the process to obtain nested events which contain trigger arguments. And then we construct nested events by replacing the trigger arguments with their corresponding detect events and so on. So um, the uh, experimenter, I mean, this is a kind of a very specific perhaps, and uh, we don't have so many systems <laughs> to compare with. So typically we're compared with the test system, which is actually a very a, extremely good in detecting uh, uh, events uh, from a shared task. And those are the various corpora, cancer genetics, the genia, infectious diseases, and multi-level event extraction data sets. Um, so um, uh, the comparison basically with the uh, other models on those five tasks, um, uh, they show basically a kind of slightly proven uh, performance. Uh, when I say single, it's actually the performance on, on each corp, one corpus or ensemble uh, but trained on all the five corpora. And actually for this, it's a single majority uh, voting. Uh, now um, I want to talk a bit more <clears throat> uh, on the nested and uh, overlapping events because um, there are different ways of, um, uh, we're still exploring about what's the best way to um, detect uh, those nested and overlapping. So I, I mentioned about the flat events are predicted first um, and about the representations becoming arguments, but uh, how actually we identify and how we search through those event arguments um, is another discussion. So uh, one of my PhD students worked on, uh, uh, used the beam search. Um, to uh, find uh, for uh, to detect events, and this is uh, has been basically um, um, created, uh, formulated in uh, in drug structures. So um, unlike um, um, uh, you know unlike the tree structure, DAGs again allow multiple paths between uh, two nodes. And uh, because of that, they're more amenable to represent uh, event structures. So in here, this case, uh, that structure relation, uh, as we can see in, the, in the, the diagram, contains again the nested events, uh, E2, which is an event two, and event three, induction, cause and theme, and um, uh, in, incorporates the event one. So they're both E2 and E3 are nested and they incorporate the common argument. 
So at this, uh, uh, basically, um, uh, we see the representation of events um, at the lower levels become the arguments of events at the uh, upper level events. Um, so uh, again, uh, the um, detection of um, events for the nested structures is quite important for the prediction of uh, and the causality of event relations. I think I'm running out of time. So um, I have to say a bit something about the, um, I have to, to skip certain things. Uh, so I'd like to um, uh, talk a bit about uh, the results of the beam search because we used uh, different other techniques. It's basically, um, um, we see a, a better performance by using this type of uh, search technique uh, on beam search, uh, again, comparing with other models of like TESS. Um, and this is actually the, the, the model SBNN is parameterized by a value K and the K here is, contains the width of the beam search. Uh, so if you have a high value or uh, allows multiple paths to be expanded. Um, so I, I'll perhaps um, I would um, stop soon, but I wanted to um, mention again that uh, based on the different observations we have done, we wanted to um, now extract uh, different types of information from events, and this is what we call epistemic or meta-knowledge. Um, and the meta-knowledge is um, we use, for instance, uh, you know, knowledge types of observation and the manner, so law or certainty. So we focused a lot on certainty, and to give you an example of that, are, are those kind of sentences. So we have, um, if something is certain, if something has a weak speculation, we suggest, we indicate, um, or we investigate, or we have an admission of lack of knowledge. So the reason we are doing that, that there's uncertainty, is because we wanted to rank the different types of information based on uncertain information and all, not only based on events. Um, sorry, I don't have the time to say much about this, but this is a work of my PhD student, Zerva, which we use the uncertainty to be able to link and rank the evidence from biomedical labs for model reconstruction and model curation. So um, um, for that, uh, we used uh, um, a sub subjective logic, but I think I'm running out of time. And I'll go straight for that one sentence, one, one, one minute. To, um, to see how we combined all that work that I mentioned before. So basically our, what we wanted to do is to um, uh, construct pathways. Um, and we created a system, the Lead Path Explorer, that allows us actually to have, um, to have the human in the loop and to look at different visualization and different um, finding information from the literature based on the evidence, on the events, but also on the events which have been uh, uh, quantified based on the confidence, based on the certainty. Um, and the example here is basically, which I'm going to put this one to stop, is that um, basically once we have, um, we have, we can have different types of confidence, citations, bibliometrics, but we have also here, we have the, the confidence which tells to what extent an event has been certain um, if, uh, for instance, the events were extracting, they have a specific polarity. And this allows us then to put a type of confidence in our system to allow us to zoom into specific types of entities which are uh, we're more confident. Um, so this is actually the way it happens. So if I have a, a pathway and I stick into discovery, the system automatically discovers from the literature all the new associations and all the new events that exist and allows me to actually drill down and focus on the entities based on the type of certainty like this. Okay, uh, thank you. I have run out of time, I think. So this is a wrap up with saying thank you, first of all, for inviting me. And um, in this work, we want to uh, integrate other types of uh, information like citation graphs, etc., and to do more advanced um, knowledge discovery. Thank you.